Hi you guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I would love to have you join the fam. And if you enjoy these videos and you want to see more, go ahead and just leave me a comment down below with a case suggestion, something that you're interested in. I would love to do that for you guys. And you guys have been so awesome, leaving me so many case suggestions. So I've really been like opening my eyes to like new cases and stuff. So I really, really um, enjoy it. And I wanted to say thank you and keep them coming. And yeah, I love our little community. So for today's case, I was actually, I think it was Instagram. Was I on Instagram or on the internet? I think it was Instagram. And I was like scrolling through like true crime or something like that. And I came across like this, like just facts or something article about um, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. And then um, I was like scrolling and then I like lost it. And I was like, wait, what? And like, I just read like a couple things about it, about this case. So I ended up just writing the names down. And I was like, I want to research more about this case because that little article that I read was interesting. So when I delved deeper into the case, I was like, oh, so let's buckle in and prepare for this crazy couple. Myra Hindley at one point was actually known as the most evil woman in Britain, which I don't know if she was, but that's what her label was. And this case takes place in the 1960s. And Myra Hindley till this day still sort of blames everything on Ian and just says that she was manipulated and that her lover made her do it. So where does the truth lie? So Myra Hindley was born on 23rd July 1942 in Cromsall, United Kingdom. And she was the first child of Bob Hindley and his wife, Hetty. Bob served in um, like a parachute regiment or something for World War II. So he was absent for for majority of Myra's like the first three years of her life and when he returned home from the war him and his family ended up moving into a two-story home on Eaton Street in Gorton. When Myra was four years old her parents had another daughter Maureen and during this time because there was another baby in the house her parents sent Myra to go and live with her grandmother and you know a few people do this because then they can have a little bit of alone time to bond with a new baby and just to sort of maybe get in a new like routine with the new baby but for Myra once she was sent to live with her grandmother she never really returned home and the fact that Myra you know didn't grow up with her main family was sort of made into a big deal that maybe this is why you know she did the things she did but she never really came from a broken home like people would like to suggest the family, you know, had not broken down and she was not unloved by her parents. You could see directly from her mother's bedroom, like the bedroom window. If you sit at the bedroom window, you could see directly into the grandmother's bedroom window. So they were living really close together, but I guess they just never really lived in the same home. And I wonder why, but maybe because it was easier for Myra's grandmother to raise her for the parents. I don't know. Their family was an ordinary Manchester, you know, working class family. And her father was pretty stoic and he, you know, enjoyed a drink here and there, but that was really common back in that day anyway. Although Myra struggled in primary school and she actually failed her year 11 exams when she moved to Ryder Bow Secondary High School, which was a pretty modern school for the time. She was known to be, you know, one of the most intelligent students in her class with an above average IQ. And she always earned really good grades, but her attendance record was really poor. And that was mainly due to the fact that her grandmother was pretty lenient on her. Like she let her, you know, just not go to school so that she could spend time with Myra at home. As Myra grew into a young woman, she was known to be pretty aggressive. As Myra grew into a young woman, she was known to be pretty tough and pretty aggressive. And some even considered her to be like pretty masculine. She had a low and husky voice and she was often mocked because of the shape of her nose. And she was even given like a really mean nickname by like students in her class where they called her square ass, which is so mean, but they called her this because she had really broad hips. 
But despite this, as a teenager herself, Myra took a number of children and teenagers under her wing. And she was actually also known as a pretty responsible babysitter. When she was 15 years old, she befriended a 13-year-old boy named Michael Higgins, but he ended up dying in a reservoir and he drowned there. And for years, Myra just felt a tremendous amount of guilt because she hadn't been there when he drowned. And she felt that if she was there, perhaps she would have been able to, you know, stop his death from occurring. And she felt this because she was a really strong swimmer. So she felt like, you know, if I was there, I would have saved him from drowning in this reservoir. So when she was 18, she got a job as a typist at Millwards, which was a chemical distribution company. And it was here on her first day of work that she met Ian Brady. He was 22 years old at the time and working in a clerical position. And he had actually been working there for a couple years, you know, prior to Myra joining. Myra became infatuated with Ian. You know, he had like this pompadour and he was a bad boy. She said that when she first met him, she was just like struck with his beautiful blue eyes, his dark hair. And she says he was one of the first boys that she had ever met in her life that kept like manicured fingernails. I feel all boys should keep their fingernails. I feel everyone in the world should keep their fingernails pretty clean. That should be normal. He was well-dressed, he was pretty unfriendly, and he drove a motorbike, so she was in love with all of it. She also knew that he had a criminal record for petty crimes and also for threatening a previous girlfriend with, like, bodily harm, but I guess those things just made him all the more attractive to Myra. And Ian also had this, like, disturbing obsession with Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. Yeah. And he was known to also spend a lot of his lunch breaks at work, just sitting in the canteen reading Mein Kampf. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but it's basically Hitler's like biography, autobiography. And Myra was, you know, smitten with him. She knew that his colleagues, you know, would call him short tempered and that he was on probation from all his, you know, petty crimes. But Myra was so infatuated with him that she just ignored all the red flags, just waving, just waving in her face. Myra wrote in her diary in detail about her fascination with him. And by December of that year, Ian um, asked Myra out and they started going on more and more dates. And then their dates became pretty predictable. They would do the same thing every time. They would go watch, you know, an X-rated movie at the cinemas. And then they would go back to Myra's house where she lived with her grandmother and then would just drink German wine all night. Now that's a date, guys. That's the way to do true romance, right? (laughs) Ian would give Myra like reading material and then during their lunch breaks at work, he would go over like all the Nazi stories and the timelines and things you do when you're a normal, normal couple. She wrote in her diary, I hope Ian and I love each other all our lives and get married and are happy ever after. So further wanting to impress Ian, Myra took to wanting to become more German for Ian, right? Because that's what you do. So she would wear short waistcoats, you know, high heeled boots and short skirts. She got rid of her brown hair and she bleached it platinum blonde and she wore red lipstick, um, you know, in order to look more Aryan to please Ian. She just kind of like, she just adopted, you know, his way of thinking, his way of life. And she even became antisocial like Ian. She later wrote a letter about Ian and his persuasion. And I want to read it to you guys. She wrote, Within months, he had convinced me that there was no God at all. He could have told me that the earth was flat, that the moon was made of green cheese, and that the sun rose in the west. I would have believed him, and such was his power of persuasion. And I know this is a real thing. Like, I know this happens. People, there are just some people that get easily persuaded by people. And I guess some people just have that persuasion power, but I mean, how do you adopt a whole different mindset? You know, I've never, I'm not that type of person. I don't get easily influenced. So for me, it's just so hard to like even fathom. More and more, Ian and Myra, they just became more and more antisocial. They withdrew from their colleagues and they spent a lot of time at the library. They would read books on war and crimes and torture. 
They started planning bank robberies and then developed an interest in guns. They never, you know, robbed any banks or, you know, ended up planning further bank robberies. But Myra was actually banned from a pistol club that she had joined because she got told that she had a really bad temperament and it wasn't suitable for the type of environment that the club was. Since her relationship with Ian began, friends and family began to get, you know, pretty concerned with Myra's change in behavior. She was once, you know, pretty shy and prudish, but after meeting Ian, she developed into just a darker version of herself. There was also another letter that she had written to a childhood friend where she actually details, like, what is it called? Concerns about her relationship with Ian, about the relationship that they were in together. But in that same letter, she had stated that she was too obsessed to ever leave him. She says in that same letter that Ian had actually drugged her once, like drugged her, but that was only, you know, mildly concerning to her. But um, as soon as she sort of sent that letter to her friend, she immediately regretted it. And then she told her friend like, please destroy this, just destroy this letter. As they grew closer and closer together, Ian began telling Myra about his really disturbing fantasies. Like he started to be pretty honest with her and the things he wanted to do in his life, you know, his lifetime goals. And while he was telling her about his twisted fantasies, Myra agreed to pose in sexually explicit photographs for Ian. There was one photograph of Myra, she's on the floor, and she's posing, but in the pose, like, oh, sorry, in the photo, you can see there's like clear whip marks across her entire body, like clear whip marks. And like I mentioned before, they used to fantasize about, you know, committing these bank robberies together. But soon those fantasies ended up evolving into child sex abuse and murder. Yeah. Which, what? How are you going to go from getting cash to getting kids? In July of 1963, the two of them started talking about, you know, how to commit the perfect murder. And in the evenings, they would drink cheap wine, experiment with sexual sadism, and then just drive through the countryside in their minivan. In June of 1963, Ian moves in with Myra in her grandmother's house. And this is where all... The bullshit begins. So let's talk about each crime. On July 12th, 1963, so just a month into their cohabitating together, Ian and Myra targeted their first victim, Pauline Reed. She was only 16 years old at the time. Pauline vanished on her way to a local disco in Gorton. So what happened was driving down Gorton Lane, Ian saw this young girl and this young girl was walking towards them and he told Myra like, okay, let's just stop the car and get her in the car. And Myra refused because she realized that this young girl, Marie, was only eight years old. So she was like, no, no way. Like the outcry of an eight-year-old girl going missing would be too much in the community. So she was like, no, this is not the first victim. We're going to move on, which I guess is accurate. But dang, like are you even sitting there and outweighing these options like this eight-year-old girl is, uh, you know, too risky. It's too dangerous. So let's try and find someone that the community will miss a little bit less. Like the fact that you even go through that in your head is insane. So they spared Marie Rock's life. And further down the road, they ended up um, spotting Pauline Reed. She was 16 years old, like I said. And Myra actually knew Pauline because Pauline was a friend of her younger sister, Maureen. The things that people do like blows my mind. But anyway, so Myra pulls over and she offers Pauline a ride home. She's like, come on, just give you a little ride home. Why are you going to walk? So Pauline gets into the van and then Myra asks her, you know, before I take you home, can you help me find like this really expensive glove that I lost in the moor, like over there? And, and it was a place called Saddleworth Moor, which I didn't know what a moor was, but it's basically like a field of like grass, like a grass field. So Myra introduces Pauline to Ian. She's like, that's my boyfriend and he's going to help me find this glove too. So the three of them drive out to Saddleworth Moor and Ian and Pauline get out of the car to look for this expensive lost glove. And Myra waited in the van. Now, Number one of how to not be a victim is 
if she's looking for her freaking glove, why isn't she out of the car looking with you guys? Like, why is she sending you with her boyfriend who you don't even know? Don't do it. I mean, first of all, why even take rides from people, right? Like, just walk. You want to walk anyway? Just walk. Just be like, I'm exercising. Leave me alone. But anyway, so after around 30 minutes, Myra says Ian comes back to the van and he says, come and look. Come and look what I did to Pauline. So then Ian and Myra, they walk out into the moor um, to the spot where Pauline lays dying from what Ian did to her. He sliced her throat twice with this large knife that Ian, you know, was carrying with him. And there were two wounds and one was like four inches wide and it was on her voice box. And then I don't understand this detail, but apparently the collar of her coat was like pushed into the wound. Like, why would you do that? And she also noticed that Pauline's clothes were, you know, disheveled. So she assumed that Ian had, you know, assaulted her too. Ian told Myra to wait with Pauline's dying body while he went back to the car to get a um, shovel that he had carried with him because he wanted to bury Pauline's body in the moor. So once they, you know, buried her body and they're on their way back home, as they're driving back home, which is horrible, they're driving back home and they pass Pauline's brother and mother, um, Joan and Paul, who were out in the streets searching for Pauline. So she had been missing for a couple hours, I'm guessing, at this point, or maybe a few hours even. Probably takes a while to bury a body. And this freaking insane couple sees her mother and her brother looking for Pauline and then knowing what they had done to Pauline, they were just like, they just kept driving. Like the guilt, if I had ever, like, not that I would ever do it, but if I had ever done something like that and then the guilt in me, like would have made me just pull over and be like, she's over there. Like, I don't understand how people do this. Like, do that's why there's criminals, right? Like, so then months later on the evening of November 23rd, 1963, Myra approached a 12 year old boy, John Kilbride at a market and she offered him a ride home. Now, I mean, if any of you guys were watching who were around in that time, I don't know if you guys are watching, but is that normal? Is that normal back in the day? Like, cause I mean, I grew up in the nineties, well, sort of nineties, two thousands. And I would have never, like, I have never, I actually have been offered rides home by people and I have been like, no, no, like I've always been super untrusting. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I just would never take it. Even if it was someone I really knew, maybe, but not if they had someone in the car that I didn't know, you know, like, I don't know. I'm just, I just don't trust people. So she tells John while he's at the market, like, I'll take you home. I'll offer you a ride home. Your parents are probably going to be so worried about you because it's so late and, you know, you need to get home. So I will do you this great favor and give you a ride home. Just to add, you know, to the deal, just to sweeten the deal a little bit, she offers John a bottle of brandy and she goes, oh, let's just drink this up. So your parents are going to be worried about you coming home late, but they're not going to be worried about you uh, coming home smelling of brandy. So don't worry about that, but you're out so late. So let me just give you this bottle of brandy and drive you home. Okay. So she tells John, like, you can drink with me. And John's like, okay. And I don't know, maybe he was only 12, but you know, maybe he was under the impression that there would be something more, like maybe she was flirting with him. I don't know. So then as they were driving, she tells John, you know, can you help me find this really expensive glove that I lost out in Salworth more? Like, just help me. And, you know, he agreed. And again, if he was running so late and this woman was worried about you running so late, why would she make you even later by making you stop for a freaking glove that she, like her dumbass lost? So it's like, I'd be like, that's your freaking problem losing a glove, you dumbass. Like, I'm not going to help you find this freaking glove. <laughs> like, anyway, so he goes, okay, let me help you find this glove. And I forgot to mention before, but Ian for John, he wasn't visible in the van. He was waiting at the back of the van. So he was still in the van, but he wasn't visible. So once they got to the moor, Ian ends up taking John into the moor while Myra once again 
waits in the van. And then Ian, you know, sexually assaults the boy, a 12 year old boy. And then he stabs him and then unsuccessfully tries to cut his throat. And when that didn't work, he decided to strangle him with a shoelace. Again, I'm guessing they did the same thing. They got their shovel, they buried John in the moor and just moved on to the next victim. Their next victim was Keither Bennett. And he was only, again, 12 years old when he vanished. And he was on his way to his grandmother's house when he vanished on the evening of June 16th, 1964. And he had literally just turned 12. Like it was only four days after his 12th birthday. And the way she lured Keither was asking him to help her with a bunch of stuff at the back of her van. And as a reward for helping her, um, she would drive him home. It would just be so much quicker getting in my van. And once again, when they were on their way home to Keither's home, apparently, she used that same excuse about this freaking lost glove that she desperately needed to find and if Keither would help her. And it's just such a dumb, like, way to lure someone. But, like, I'm looking for this lost glove. Like, help me find a glove. Just go buy a new glove. Or look for it yourself in the daytime. Why are you asking me to look for it in the nighttime in a freaking field, you know? But it also speaks to the fact that these freaking children were so innocent and kind and polite and just wanted to help someone, you know? And again, help a couple. Like there was two of them. Just go help each other, you know? But it's just they, they were kids. So once again, while they were at the moor, Ian and Keither go out to look for the glove while Myra waited in the van. And after 30 minutes or so, Ian gets into the van and Myra asks him, okay, well, what did you do to him? And he tells her, yep, sexually assaulted him. And then I strangled him with a piece of string. So on Boxing Day in 1964, which is December 26, Ian and Myra were at a fairground when they spotted Leslie Downey. And they saw Leslie Downey waiting by a car. And it was like, she was just waiting there by herself. And when it was clear that she was alone, which Leslie was only 10 years old. So why is she alone? You know? Ugh. So anyway, so when they realized she was alone, they walked by her and they had some shopping in their hands and they pretended to drop it right in front of her. And obviously she saw it. She tried to help them. And then they said, oh, well, can you help us like put everything into our car? And then they even said, okay, while you're helping us put it into the car, can you also help us carry it home, like into our house? Which again, she was only 10 years old. So she probably was just trying to do the right thing and help, you know, some people out. So once inside Ian and Myra's house, they undressed her they gagged her and they forced her to pose for photographs and then this little 10 year old girl she was raped and killed by either a string or a shoelace like there are reports that differ between the two but either way she was strangled and Myra always asserts that when they got home and everything was happening to Leslie she went away to run a bath for herself right and when she returned Ian had done all this to 10 year old Leslie, but Ian later on when they got caught was like, no, no, no. It was actually Myra who killed Leslie. So the following morning, the stupid couple, they drive back to Saddleworth Moor, which what is like their cemetery now. And they bury Leslie's body completely naked. And then they had her clothes like piled up at her feet. And you know what I was thinking? Like, I just thought about this. Hold up. Doesn't Myra live with her grandmother? So how is all this happening in her grandmother's house? I mean, was the house massive? Probably not because you could look directly from the mother's bedroom into the grand grandmother's bedroom. So I'm guessing the houses were like close together, but what's the grandma doing? Like, why is this happening in her house? And she doesn't know. Hello, did anyone question the grandmother? So on October 6th, 1965, Myra drives Ian to the Manchester Central Railway Station so that he could pick out his new victim. And Myra waited in the car while he went and approached people. And he approached 17-year-old Edward Evans and invited him back to their house just to hang out and drink. And again, what is this freaking time like, what is life like back then? Because who would go to someone's house, some random person's house, 
to drink like just a random person like what is going on and he was only 17 so then once at the house they drank a bottle of wine together and they just relaxed and then ian tells myra to invite her brother-in-law so maureen's husband to the house to come and join them myra's brother-in-law was 17 year old david smith and he was the husband yeah husband of her younger sister maureen now myra's family yeah, and maureen's family didn't approve of Maureen's marriage to David because he had several criminal convictions, including um, breaking and entering and threatening bodily harm. I mean, this was identical to freaking Ian's criminal record too, so okay. But Myra herself didn't approve of this relationship either, which where the hell does she have even room to criticize this? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know what I'm saying? You know, those sisters really know how to – how to choose those those good men. And Myra didn't go to the wedding that David and Maureen had, and it was a pretty rushed wedding, and it took place when Maureen was seven months pregnant already. Ian and David, however, they got along really well, and David was kind of impressed with Ian. Ian gave David books to read, and they would always talk about murder and robbery, like that's the kind of topics they would discuss. And while David was impressed with Ian, he also really enjoyed the frequent, you know, couple dates that the four of them would go on together. Ian considered David a friend and thought that he could be a partner in crime to Myra and his adventures. Myra, however, became increasingly worried about Ian trying to involve David and thinking that the more that he knew he could possibly compromise their safety, you know, like, would he snitch? So the night that they brought Edward into the house, so their fourth victim, is it? The fourth one? Ian tells Myra to call David to the house and David arrives to the house, the, Myra's house, to Myra screaming at David to go and help Ian. David enters the living room to find Ian repeatedly hitting uh, Edward with the flat end of an axe and he just sees him there like bashing him and throttling him and then eventually strangling him with an electrical cord and again like I mentioned before this is happening in the living room like where is the grandmother you know what I'm saying like was she too old at this point like was she just in her bedroom like these kids you know like what what is going on so then after all this happens Ian asks David to go and get rid of of um edward's body for ian and in the moment david like he agrees because maybe he was scared maybe he panicked so as david attempted to get rid or carry the body away the body was too heavy for david to do it you know by himself and in the attack on edward ian had sprained his ankle so he couldn't help David get rid of the body. So they said, okay, let's just wrap Edward's body in like this plastic sheet and then drag it into this room. And they put Edward's body into the spare bedroom until they, you know, well, Ian's leg could heal a little bit and then they'll get rid of the body the next day together. So Ian must have, or Myra and Ian must have really trusted David because then David, like they let David go home. Like I would have told David, you know, you better freaking stay the night, you know, because he just witnessed a murder. But anyway, so when he gets home, David tells Maureen everything that had happened. And Maureen was like, are you insane? We need to call the police ASAP right now. So they go to a nearby phone booth and they bring a knife with them in case they, well, they were worried that Ian would follow them or, you know, would catch them snitch into the police and they call the police and they tell them everything. And this is what David said to the police. He says, Ian opened the door and he led me into the kitchen. When I first walked into the house, the door to the living room was closed and Ian went to the living room and I waited in the kitchen. I waited about a minute or two and then I suddenly heard one hell of a scream. It sounded like a woman, really, really high pitched. Then the screams carried on one after another really loud. Then I heard Myra shout, Dave, Dave, help him, very loudly. When I ran in, I just stood inside the living room and I saw a young lad. 
He was lying there with his head and shoulders on the couch and his legs were on the floor. He was facing upwards. Ian was standing over him, facing him with his legs on either side of the young lad's legs. The lad was still screaming. Ian had a hatchet in his hand. He was holding it above his head and he hit the lad on the left side of his head with the hatchet. I heard the blow. It was a terrible hard blow. It sounded horrible. Back to the grandma. It's loud. Everyone's yelling. Where are you at, grandma? Am I the only one? Worrying about the grandma. Like, this don't make sense. So early on the morning of October 7th, 1965, shortly after David confessed everything to the police, the cops arrive at Ian and Myra's house to find Ian writing, like, this letter to his employer saying, oh, I cannot come to work today because, you know, of my ankle injury. And the police explained that they had arrived at the house because they had heard about an act of violence and they needed to investigate. And the police obviously wanted to look around the house. So Myra was like, nothing has happened. Go look around the house. So the spare bedroom, which Edward's body was in, the door to that room was locked. And they demanded that Myra and Ian, because they looked at the rest of the house. So they were like, hello, give us the key to this room. We need to see what's inside. And I mean, what did they think? What did Myra and Ian think? Like, oh, this door is locked. How will we ever get in? I guess we should just move on. Like, it's so stupid. Like, why let the cops even come in? You should have been like, no, you don't have a warrant. Like, so dumb. This is so dumb. So... I don't know if they gave the key or the police ended up breaking the door down. They discovered Edward's body wrapped in plastic as they were obviously going to because we're still in the house. They arrested Ian on the suspicion of murder. Ian told police that him and Eddie got into a fight and it just got out of hand. And Myra was never arrested with Ian at the time, but she demanded to go to the police station with Ian and when she was at the police station, she just kept saying that it was an accident and yeah, they just had this fight and it was an accident. And because police had no evidence against Myra that she had done anything or was involved in the murder, they allowed her to go home, you know, on the promise that she would return the next day for police questioning. I mean, it was so like lenient back then sometimes, like sometimes. I mean, what did they do? They made her like swear on her teddy bear like that you're gonna come back to the police station and get this interview what if she ran you know like so silly during his questioning ian admitted that him and edward fought but that myra had nothing to do with it and she was just doing what she was told to do however on october 11th myra was arrested as an accessory to the murder and she was remanded to risley prison after new evidence emerged that she was directly tied to the murder of Edward Evans because also the fact that she had driven Ian to go pick out his victim at the train station. When David, the brother-in-law, was questioned, he stated that he knew that Ian had dodgy books and he had packed them into suitcases and he was worried about what cops would think of these books. And David said he had no idea what was in these books or where Ian had put them, but he knew that Ian had a thing for railway stations. The police requested a search of all Manchester railway stations, their left luggage area, um, for any luggages belonging to Ian. And on October 15th, they had a hit and they found a suitcase belonging to Ian, which had pornographic photos of a young girl naked and with a scarf tied across her mouth. And there was also a horrible 16 minute recording of this same girl screaming and pleading for help. Anne Downey, um, Leslie Downey's mother, the 10 year old girl, um, yeah, she listened to the recording and she confirmed that it was her daughter's voice, which I don't even know how she did that without, I mean, I don't know if she broke down, but I'm guessing she did. That must have been so difficult for Leslie's mother to even do. And yeah, I just don't know how, how they do that. You know, it's insane. So during a further search of Ian and Myra's home, technically the grandmother's home, they find this notebook with um, John Kilbride's name in it. 
and they knew John to be an open missing persons case and the police became immediately suspicious that Ian and Myra had everything to do with the disappearances of these missing children. A collection of photographs at Saddle Worth Moor found in the same home directed cops exactly where to begin looking for these victims. The first body to be discovered was 10-year-old Leslie Downey, and five days later, John Kilbride's body was identified by his clothing, and he was too badly decomposed to be identified in any other way. Police suspected that there were way more bodies in that moor, but because winter was approaching, they decided to call the search off. Then presented with the evidence that the police found in Ian's suitcase of, you know, the young girl, Ian admitted to taking the photos of Leslie, but he just denied killing her. He claimed that two men brought Leslie to the house so that he could take photos of her and then they left with Leslie while she was still alive. And police didn't believe this story because, of course, they didn't because it's bullcrap. So Ian was then charged with the murders of Leslie, Edward, and John. Myra was charged with the murders of Edward and Leslie and charged as an accessory to the murder of John. It took 14 days, beginning on April 19th, 1966, for the trials of Ian and Myra to wrap up, both Ian and Myra gave testimony in the court. Some interesting points during the trial is that they both pled not guilty and they both denied killing Edward, despite the fact that their body, that Edward's body, was found wrapped up in plastic in their home. And despite the fact that their brother in law and friend, David, witnessed the whole incident and accused them of it. The pathologist's um, autopsy report stated that Edward's death was accelerated by strangulation and Ian only ever admitted to hitting Edward with the axe and he claimed in court, okay, if, you know, Edward died from axe blows, then yeah, I killed him, which I think he thought he was trying to be like clever, like I only hit him with an axe, so if he died from strangulation, that wasn't me. But if he died from the axe blow, it was me. But it didn't freaking help his case. And then the recording from a poor screaming Leslie was played in court as well. And you can clearly hear Ian and Myra's voices in this same recording. But Myra says that during the time of the attacks and when the photographs were being taken, she was looking out a window in another room and when Myra was being, sorry, when Leslie was being killed, she was running a bath, you know, having a little bath. And apparently she had no idea what had happened to Leslie. Again, she just doesn't take responsibility for any of her freaking crimes. Completely trying to like shift blame from herself when she helped her sick, twisted boyfriend do what he did. Whether she physically killed those kids or not, what's this, strangled those kids or not, or killed, whatever. She's 100% responsible too. She helped him. It took only two hours for the jury to find them both guilty on all counts. So during the time that Ian and Myra were waiting trial, the death penalty had been abolished. So the judge passed the only sentence which he believed to be just as bad and which was new at the time, which was life imprisonment. So the both of them got life imprisonment. So in 1985, Ian confesses to all the murders, including the then unknown murders of Pauline Reed and Keither Bennett. So then the police actively begin searching that more again, looking for the bodies and trying to help the families out. And Keith's mother actually wrote this long letter to Myra and asked her, please, you know, please tell us where Keith is buried. We really want to find him. So at this stage, Myra was still refusing to acknowledge her involvement in these murders but however she did um offer to show police the places in the moor that her and ian would frequent police tried to show like they showed her photographs of the moor and said like okay which which areas but she refused and said the only way she can show them is if she physically goes out into the moor police initially were quite cynical about her motivation in going to the moor but they ended up agreeing to it because the chance of finding more victims was more important than you know believing her crap 
During her first visit to the moor in December of 1986, she wasn't helpful at all and she even claimed that she was too traumatized from the helicopter ride to remember anything. And only a couple of months later when she had her solicitor with her, her lawyer with her, did she admit to all five of the murders taking place. And this was her formal confession and the confession tapes of Myra's is like over 17 hours long, which how can it even be that long? So one of the detectives on the case, his name was Topping, he believed that Myra's confession was just like a super like well like worked well he felt like it was a performance and that she had planned it everything that she was going to say and she only told the detectives and the police as much as she wanted them to know and no more he also added the fact that Myra always claimed to be somewhere else whenever the killings were taking place you know she was in the bathroom running a bath she was in the kitchen she was looking out this window she was in the car room you know she was freaking listening to some music she was just never there when any of these crimes took place and when apparently you know Edward who was getting bashed in the home when that was taking place she was in the kitchen you know just probably preparing a sandwich like so dumb and this detective basically said that when the confession was taking place he just witnessed a great performance as opposed to a true confession where she was remorseful so police ended up taking Myra's confession and went to visit Ian in prison and they wanted a confession from him too a formal one not just some story given to a journalist and at first Ian was like nah there's no way that Myra confessed against me like there's absolutely zero chance but then when he was shown the tapes and the evidence he was like okay all right you want to play let's play so he ended up giving his side of the story and his confession and the one thing that he wanted after his confession was given he was like okay I'm going to give you this confession but um after my confession, I want to be given the means to take my own life. So he wanted to just end his life after giving the um, confessions and being like, okay, peace out. In March of 1987, Myra made her second trip out to the moors to show the locations of the bodies. And this time she was able to show the police two locations where they should concentrate their searches. And she wasn't able to locate the actual graves, but she was able to remember like there were these rock formations and things like that to narrow down the search. On July 1st, 1987, a body was found buried at three feet deep and just a hundred yards from where Leslie's body was found. And this body was later identified to be that of Pauline Reed, their first victim. And I mean, this was over 25 years later. So can you imagine that poor family suffering for 25 years, wondering what happened to their 16 year old daughter? So I remember Ian, he only offered to give the confession if he was allowed to commit suicide. So he had been holding off on his confession for months until they found Pauline's body. And when he found out they found Pauline's body, he was like, okay, I'm gonna give you a full confession. Um, to find Keith's body. Ian also wrote a letter uh, to the media through his solicitor, basically stating that, okay, I'm going to also be like Myra and help you guys find all the bodies and just help the families. On July 3rd, Ian took his first trip out to the moors and he quickly lost his bearings because he was blaming it on all the geographical changes that had taken place over the last 20 years and he couldn't figure out where everything was. And the search was called off and Topping, the detective, was like, okay, Ian, you are full of shit. So he basically felt that it was just a time, time-wasting strategy. And I think a lot of criminals do this. I mean, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I feel like they do this just to get out of the jail cell for a day or for a few hours or a few minutes, whatever it may be, like just to have a break from the prison. Like it's like a little, you know, excursion for them. And they probably want to waste the police time so that the police takes them over and over again and again. So they get their little free times. So when the detective uh, refused to let Ian go back to the moor for a second time, he ended up writing a letter to the media again, saying that there were five additional murders that no one knew about and that the police wasn't taking this seriously. And they were apparently um, a Piccadilly man in Manchester, a victim in the Saddlewood Moor, which doesn't make sense, two victims from Scotland and one woman who he said he threw into a canal, um, but he refused to give these people's names, that woman's names. He just refused to give the names of these people, but he said there were five additional murders. Police isn't, police aren't taking this seriously. And the police weren't taking this seriously because they couldn't find sufficient information about these missing people. And they just decided not to waste their time investigating this and thinking it was just 
in talking shit. So then on December 1st, the police agreed to take Ian. Oh my God. Annoying. Um, the police agreed to take Ian back to the moor for the second time to find Keith's body. So they took him there. And then again, Ian wasted their time and they were like, you know what? We can't find the grave and we need to call off the search for um, Keith. But in 2003, the police ended up putting on an operation to find the body of Keith, which is kind of insane because this was like 40 years later and for 40 years, this poor family was just wondering what happened to their son, to their nephew, to their brother. It's just like so sad. Like, how do you move on and live normally? You know, you don't. So they used personal photographs taken by Myra and Ian and then also used like satellite like imaging to see if there was like soil um, formations or disruptions and they found nothing and in 2009 so that's like ages of searching they officially called it off saying it would take like major scientific breakthroughs to even find his body because it's been too many years as of today Keith's body has never been found but you know what's crazy if you go to those moors his family can still be found there searching for his body because isn't that so sad in the 1990s myra finally opened up about the murders and it seemed like she was almost about to take responsibility like she was inching towards it but she hadn't taken full responsibility as yet and she claimed that yes she took part in these murders but only because ian drugged her he threatened to kill you know her sister maureen he threatened her with those pornographic pictures that he had taken of her and just all these excuses. And she even claimed that, it's not funny, but she even claimed that Ian threatened to kill her beloved dog, Puppet. And in a 2008 interview, Myra Solicitor said a quote, so I'll read that. She stated, I ought to have been hanged. I deserved it. My crime was worse than Ian's because I enticed the children and they would never have entered the car without my role in it. I've always regarded myself as worse than Ian. When Myra's dog, Puppet, he died during an oral exam, which required like anesthesia. She accused the police of murdering her dog as like revenge on her. But the police was actually trying to determine the dog's age so they could like... I think correlated with the photographs they had found in Ian's suitcase of the victims. And in a letter to her mother, Myra writes that the dog's death has hurt her more than anything. And she doesn't, she doesn't know if she'll recover from it. And this is like the worst thing that has ever happened to her. And she's never fe felt pain like this before. So all those deaths of human beings was not as bad as a dog dying. Like people be cray cray. Ian spent 19 years in like regular mainstream prisons before he was um, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. So then he was transferred to a really high security psychiatric hospital. And that was in 1985. And he would later die at this hospital in 2017 because of pulmonary heart failure. And he died at the age of 79. Before his death, when he was 79 years old, he tried multiple times, multiple sui uh, suicide attempts, and he would just stop eating. That was his way of trying to die and then the you know the hospital would like reinstate feeding tubes with him and like force feed him and before his actual death he spent 48 hours refusing food but that wasn't the cause of his actual death and in March of 2000 he wanted the courts to review the fact that he was being force fed like with a feeding tube and he's like this is not right this is the taking away my human right of doing what I want to do like yeah, because you're in jail, buddy. He wrote a statement saying, I have to fight simply to die. I have had enough. I want nothing. My objective is to die and release myself from this once and for all. So you can see my death strike is rational and pragmatic. I'm only sorry I didn't do it decades ago and I'm eager to leave this cesspit in a coffin. Now, look, you committed these horrible crimes and now you're like, I've had enough. I want to end it. Like, you don't get to commit suicide and just run away from all of this. You know what I mean? It's such a weak and cowardly way to escape these crimes you commit. I mean, you kill these children, you need to suffer the consequences. You don't get to cheat by 
taking your life and being like, bye bye, I'm done, I'm over it now, so see you later, guys. Like, no. So unlike Ian, Myra, she just continuously lodged appeals on her conviction saying that she wasn't guilty. And in 1971, she officially ended her relationship with Ian through a letter saying that she had fallen in love with a female prison guard, Patricia, Patricia Cairns. And the two of them actually planned, so Patricia and Myra actually planned a prison escape, but this was intercepted when other guards found impressions of prison keys, like they were going to make extra prison keys. And Patricia was sentenced to six years in jails for her part in this plot. On November 15, 2002, Myra died from bronchial pneumonia at the age of 60. And she was um, a person who smoked 40 cigarettes a day, um, but she was diagnosed with angina in 1999. So she lived a couple years more following this diagnosis and her ashes were scattered by this freaking prison guard. What is wrong with people? this prison guard um, near Saddlewood Moor, like near the victims where she committed those crimes. That's where her ashes were scattered. Crazy. Stories like this are always interesting because it's like, was she really involved? Was she, you know, weak and forced into this, manipulated and just blackmailed into this, like doing the crimes that she committed? Did she have no other choice? You know, was she, she just had to do it. And in some cases that is true that there are people that just get forced and blackmailed and manipulated, like, and they are weaker. So they, they fall for it and they just don't know what to do. I understand that there are situations like that, that exist, but I feel that if Myra really was doing this against her will, the moment that the police came into that house and they um, found Edward's body wrapped in plastic and they arrested Ian, she would have spilled everything, been like, oh my God, the police finally know this is exactly what he made me do. Like she would have, I think she would have at least confessed at the time that she was being blackmailed and at the time that she was being forced into this and that she didn't want to do any of this. And Ian was blah, 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 you know? And maybe she would have been when the police came, she would have been like, oh, thank God the police are finally here. I, I'm I'm free from this. I don't have to live with this nightmare anymore. But she didn't. She um, withheld all the information and she claimed that nothing happened. For 20 years, she continued to deny that either of them had anything to do with any of the murders. And when she finally did confess, she was like, but I wasn't there. I was, I was in the bathroom. I was in the shower. I was cooking a meal. I was taking a freaking who knows, like, you know? So I feel like in that instance that she was guilty and she was just trying to just like, as in, we know she was guilty, but it was like her guilty conscience preventing her from being like, yes, I had everything to do with it. She was trying to be like, no, 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 I wasn't there. Like I wasn't really involved, but I was involved. Like who knows? Cause she probably just didn't want to deal with what she had been doing, what she had done. So what do you guys think? I mean, they killed so many young, young, young people in such a short period of time. And what's funny is that the, if they hadn't trusted um, Maureen's husband, David, like they possibly would never have been caught. Can you imagine how many more young victims they would have had? Like if David actually helped them and now they had a third accomplice, like it would have, they would have just, they would have just been on a roll. In a weird way, David and Maureen technically saved so many possible lives. It's crazy to think about. So what do you guys think of this case? Do you feel like justice was served? Do you feel like David and Maureen should have been in trouble? No, not really. They didn't do anything, right? So no, ignore that. But what do you guys think? What do you guys think of this case? Have you heard it before? And yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And I hope you guys enjoy today's video. And I will see you in my next one. This is just guys. Mwah. Bye. Oh, wait. And if you want to check out some more videos, you know what to do. <laughs> see you next time, guys.